Possiamo riprendere la seduta pomeridiana introducendo eh, il dottor Klaus Lucke con la relazione Is Medical Therapeutic Freedom and Endangered Species? Scusate il mio inglese. Prego. Credo che farà anche un um, salto attraverso i, i punti salienti della sua chirurgia così come gestita in terapia combinata. Yes, before I start with my last talk, I just wanted to show you quickly a different way of doing surgery for an epiretinal membrane. It's my standard way of doing it, and it is not the standard way of doing it. This video here is a total of 27 minutes. It's unedited. This is operation from beginning to end. And I'm not going to show you the whole 27 minutes. I'm just sort of going to pull you through it uh, bit by bit. I hope it moves. Why doesn't it move? So that has happened before. Wait a second. We'll try that again. Yeah, now it moves. So, I start out with a, limb, with a little incision into the conjunctiva, as I told you, from about 1 o'clock to 11 o'clock. Then a frown incision for the cataract, a corneoscleral incision into the anterior chamber, two paracentesis, and a normal cataract procedure, except that the phaco incision is down here. It's a frown incision in the sclera. As I explained earlier on, it's much safer if you want to indent, which I'm going to do a little bit later. So normal cataract procedure. Usually we're dealing with very soft lenses in these cases because cataract wasn't the primary indication. Put in an IOL, all that is standard. Nothing to really show. We're almost halfway through the operation. What I think is very important is that I polish the epithelium of the anterior capsule very thoroughly. I take away any epithelial cells that I can see because I don't want anterior capsule fibrosis, which then later on will make it difficult to look into the periphery of the retina. So, once we're done with that, we hydrate the sclerotomies and the anterior segment is finished. Now here are the wedge incisions, one temporal, one nasal, with their counter incisions, like so, so a wedge in between. The one that I'm doing most work through, I'm enlarging a little bit V-shaped so that the instruments pass through better. Counter incision on this side. Then we have a self-retaining cannula. It has a little edge to it there. So no sutures, just insert it and it sticks. Make sure it's inside. And then I go to flow control with 20 milliliters per minute for the central vitreous. 20 milliliters of per minute is a lot of flow. So I confine myself to the center of the vitreous cavity. We are 12 minutes into the operation now. So a 20 gauge cutter. I could use a 23 gauge cutter or a 25 gauge cutter if you wanted to. The size doesn't matter. But if I want to be efficient, I take a large cutter because I want to get rid of a lot of volume fast. And it takes me 45 seconds to get rid of the central vitreous at 20 milliliters per minute. It's very quick. So let's continue. That's the central vitreous, and now we come to the periphery. The vitreous is detached. I'm sort of going at three milliliters per minute now because there's not a lot of volume I want to move. I want to be safe and not pull on the retina very hard. And you see that I don't use a biome. I just use the microscope optics, which show me the equator, the space anterior to the equator, and the aura serrata, and particularly the Scott line where the vitreous is inserted into the retina. So I indent, you see the aura serrata very well. 
and I think I see it better than under the biome, and I don't need a light pipe. You see the vitreous extremely well. When things get dicey, I actually go down to a very low cut rate, single cuts sometimes. When I find there's traction on the retina, I'm at maximum three milliliters per minute, so I can now control my flow between zero and three. And I do that 360 degrees all the way around. And you see that I remove the vitreous all the way down to the Scott line. There is no vitreous left posterior to its insertion into the retina. And then, let's move on, 360 degrees. Indentation either with a, a cotton tip, most of the time. There are certain areas like the nasal lower quadrant where you can't indent well because the fornix is so shallow. And that's when I use a metal uh, indenter, and I sometimes go with a metal indenter underneath the conjunctiva in order to get into the lower quadrants. I can even remove the vitreous in the meridian of the active port. I can see all the way to the aura serrata and remove the vitreous there. To make sure I don't have vitreous I can pull on when I insert instruments. I don't want any vitreous left particularly in that meridian. That's the dangerous one, and that's the one I check at the very end. So we are now 19 minutes into the operation, and we haven't even really started the operation yet. It's all preliminaries. Now we start with a slit lamp, I think. Contact lens. Slit lamp illumination. 21 minutes into the operation. Now you see the glistening on the surface of the retina, the way you see it in your office at the slit lamp, which you don't see with a biome and a light pipe. With a light pipe, you don't see this glistening of the membrane. You see that much better when you use a slit lamp illumination. And the rest is standard. Put in green stuff. Start peeling. We're 22 minutes into the operation. So most of the time of the operation is spent on the lens and on the peripheral vitreous, which are the most important things. Membrane, okay, we do that as well. Can I ask something? In Please. The, uh, so, uh, y but you didn't use the PVD. This case before. had a spontaneous PVD. Okay, because otherwise you were... Uh, otherwise, you were the, uh, under uh, the slit lamp, I would go so down to first, the bottom and pull up the okay, vitreous. Because, yeah. okay. But then if you get, then get a tear in the periphery, you can still deal with it under deep indentation without a biome. Uh, we saw doing the, the, uh, the trimming before mm -hmm. the induction right. of PVD. And if I, if I inadvertently made a cut in the retina, yeah. I put laser or cryo and put some gas at the end. No, just because then you need to do again otherwise if you induce a PVD. So that's what. No. So that's that part. Peel the ILM. And let's get to the end. In the end, I put a little bit of air. 25 minutes, 40 seconds. And this air is only to close the wedges because the high surface tension prevents fluid getting out through the wedges. Now, unfortunately, I'm sort of a little bit out of the picture. If there are any remnants of vitreous in the wedges, in the sclerotomy, I clean it now, so it is perfectly closed. Take out this infusion line, which is just holding on to its self-retaining edge. Also clean some vitreous there, if there's vitreous left. I haven't done a thorough vitrectomy there. And then that's it. The last thing is diathermy. 
for exactly 27 minutes now for a combined procedure without sutures, without light pipe, without trocars. So it's quick and it's cheap. Material cost is minimal. Have you never seen the day after the conjunctiva open? Uh, sometimes it's slightly dehiscent, yes. But, but I've never had to research. Research, it. okay. And I have once calculated, a partner of mine is doing it with trocars. <laughs> Using the same amount of time, it's not faster. And the price difference is 268 euro of throwaway stuff. So, a different way of doing things. Hi, Barbara. Congratulations. Well done this morning. So, just wanted to show you this. Any comments on that? No, nobody has a comment. Everybody's going to do it like that tomorrow, right? Huh? No, I mean, we already had discussion in between. Okay. So, my final talk is on medical therapeutic freedom. Is that an endangered species? And I think this is a very, very important political subject at the moment. And you see, I do operate differently from others. And that is because I like my freedom. I like to think for myself. I think medicine is an art. We have learned facts. We've learned to put them together. We have gained experience. We have learned how to deal with patients. And all this we put together in our profession to help other patients. This is what being a doctor is all about. But it's not that easy. Already in 1995, a German high federal court decided that a certified drug cannot be prescribed at public health cost for an indication that is not covered by the certification. And that has huge consequences. As, for instance, pediatricians found out in 2004 that we're giving broad-spectrum antibiotics to kids with pneumonia and were sued in court. They should have used penicillin because only penicillin was certified. I mean, if the kids die, who cares? Certification is what counts. And so the doctors were in deep trouble. Fortunately, the case was dropped later on. So where do doctors stand today? under all these problems. They are dealing with administrative requirements, financial constraints, evidence-based medicine, guideline-oriented therapy, ethics board approval, malpractice suits, lots of red tapes, forms, forms, forms. I think you all know what I'm talking about. Doctors are quagmired in paper, in paperwork, in regulations. And the poor patients are being left out in the cold. That is the situation. Let's look at a few examples, like for instance macular hole surgery. Macular hole surgery was first reported by uh, Kerry and Wendell in 1991. We did our own first operation in 1994, and at that time nobody stopped us. But in a major European country, I'm not gonna name names at the moment, that did not allow that surgery. Because you cannot do that type of surgery, you need a randomized trial first. And they took about three years to plan that trial. It must have cost the millions of pounds. Oh, sorry, now I gave away the country. And in the end, it was all abandoned because by that time everybody was laughing at them. Because how can you randomize macular holes in 1997 to observation and surgery? at a time when everybody was having 85 to 95 percent success rates. It was ridiculous. But hundreds, if not thousands of patients in Great Britain did not achieve the vision they would have got if bureaucracy hadn't got into the way. And I always say once I retire, I'll write a book with the subject, Cause of Blindness, Bureaucracy. After all, evidence-based medicine may not be everything. There's a beautiful paper in the British Medical Journal, 2003, you know the BMG is a very, very well-renowned paper, where Smith and Pell investigated the parachute used to prevent death and major trauma related to what they call gravitational challenge. They did a systematic review of the randomized controlled trials to that subject and found there weren't any. 
after all, if you fall out of a plane without a parachute, you may survive. And some people die while wearing a parachute. So how do we know what is better, parachute or no parachute? After all, enthusiasm for parachute might be just the lobbyism of the industry that want to produce parachutes. So they suggest that we introduce randomized trials to establish the value of parachutes during gravitational challenges. And I think everybody who is so much in favor of evidence-based medicine should be very much in favor of such trials and should, in my opinion, should volunteer for the placebo side of the trial. There is an interesting book, who knows this, Incognito. Nobody. Go out and buy it. Incognito was written by David Eagleman, and David Eagleman is a neurophysiologist. And the incredible thing about this book is, it is the only book probably ever written by a neurophysiologist which you cannot put down at night. It is so fascinating. Actually, my wife read it first, and I couldn't even talk to her, she was so fascinated, and then she made me read it. There are many, many interesting chapters in it. One of the most interesting one is the one on chick sexing. Now you would wonder, I'm probably wondering what that is. There are people who are chick sexes. They have all these chicks there, and then they pick up one and say, female, male, male, female. Those go to Kentucky Fried Chicken, those are made to lay, lay eggs. And these chick sexes, sexes are very good at it. They must be, it's an industrial job. The interesting part is, they cannot write a book on how to distinguish them. They all look the same. There's nothing hanging out, there are no orifices, there's nothing that will tell the two apart. Only chick sexers can tell chicks apart. And the only way you can become a chick sexer is to sit next to a chick sexer for days, weeks, months, and, and then try do it yourself and improve your success rate. Without ever, ever being able to tell anybody how you tell the difference. David Eagleman in this book points out that it is not 99% of our life that is directed by or controlled by our subconscious. It's 99.9. .9. And chick sexing is a subconscious act. And I think we've done something entirely wrong by doing away with assistance at surgery and doing it ourselves and then one day giving them a book and showing them a few videos and saying, now you do vitreous surgery. What we did in the old days, we had to move these contact lenses. Uh, we got sick and tired of them. We got into fights with our chiefs. Uh, we found it utterly boring, but we were probably chick sexing at the time. We were learning things into our subconscious that we weren't aware of. And we have lost that art. It is an art to learn things you're not aware of. So there are skills that you cannot write into a book, that you cannot put into a guideline, that you just acquire by experience and by learning. But the ideal doctor is seen by government, health insurances, and industry, doesn't have skills. He looks like this. He just, all, the, all of them are the same, have the same training, and have the same guidelines, and off they go. John F. Kennedy had something to say to that. Conformity is the jailer of freedom and the enemy of growth, and I couldn't agree more. Metro Goldwyn Meyer has this strong statement of a line. Beneath their logo, Ars Gratia Artis, which means art for art's sake. And if you look in the dictionary, it designates art that is independent of political and social requirements. It is art for the purpose of art, which medicine should be about because we should be independent from political and social requirements. They are just bogging us down. <coughs> and this is also the idea that was behind Didier Ducourneau and me founding the EVRS. We wanted to be independent, we wanted to make our own decisions, and we wanted to learn from each other. And lots of what you saw in that previous video with me working with the slit lamp and so on, I learned from Didier, or the wedges I learned from Peter van der Biesen. Just by this exchange, you learn and you grow and you develop skills that you otherwise wouldn't have. 
he was probably thinking of what something Voltaire said, dare to think for yourself. I might have been thinking of something Albert Einstein said, blind belief in authority is the greatest enemy of truth. And my favorite hero of all times once said, there's no such thing as part freedom. You're either free in your thinking or you're not. You cannot be partially free. So this is the special philosophy of EVRS. It's a culture of free and extensive discussions. There's no hierarchy. We all work on the same level. We are totally open towards diverging and unusual ideas, which means we listen to people who think out of the box. We even listen to people who think without there being a box in sight. We don't discriminate and exclude because of lack of randomization. Don't listen to him, he hasn't randomized it. Come on, it might be a brilliant idea. Do you think anybody would have ever developed macular hole surgery if the thinking in 1991 was the same as it is now? We wouldn't to this very day know that it, could, that it is possible. So we don't discriminate because of lack of ethics board approval. That's how our studies have been made possible. And we do this, don't discriminate because of unusual ideas and studies. That's why we have open discussions some of our congresses have as their motto, my way, where anybody can present what they think is new and interesting and what they have learned and found out. And in the brochure for the last meeting in Porto, it said, in Porto, we do not listen to a seemingly endless series of presentations devoted to yet another study on yet another aspect of yet another intravitreal medication. Standard fare at many international congresses these days and the uh, the subspecialty day in retina at the academy is just a collection of injection studies that all sound and look the same. And I once said to Julia Haller, what we really need or what the AMD patients really need is one more study that randomizes them to this, this, this or that study. I mean, it's getting ridiculous. But it's dangerous to be right in matters on which the established authorities are wrong. Voltaire again. And that means many people get on that bus. Let's take another example. Illuvian, I believe it's not available here yet, but in Germany it's certified. Illuvian is a cortisone implant, sort of a little bit like Ozordex. In Germany it's certified for diabetic edema. Its effect effectivity in the phase three trials was roughly the same as, I mean all the curves are the same, as anti-VEGF, but it lasts for two to three years. That's the good news. The bad news is 80% of the patients get a cataract and more than 25% get a glaucoma, the majority of which need surgery for glaucoma. So it's a high complication rate. Uh, the minor negative news is that it's 9,832 euro and 28 cents plus injection. But we have learned yesterday that there is a better way to treat with diabetic edema. And if we think, we haven't tested it, but there's every likelihood that Illuvian is somewhere along the blue line, the red line is better, and it doesn't cost 9,832 euro and 28 cents. So, surgery in the studies for Illuvian obviously was not tested as an option. Why not? Because the studies are paid for by the industry, and the industry is no, not interested in testing against surgery. It is even ignored in the literature the European Ophthalmic Review did a review of diabetic macular edema in winter of 2013 and the EDRS study came out in September 2012, more than a year earlier. Surgery, surgery is not even mentioned as an option, never mind the results. In the guidelines all over the world, you will not find surgery as an option. I've been talking to the retinologists in Germany all the time that it should be put at least as an option into the guidelines. No, they won't listen. After all, surgery is cheaper, it's longer acting. Once the retina is dry, it stays dry, and it doesn't cause glaucoma. On the other hand, if you had a uveitis, you would love to get Illuvian. It's great stuff. Cortisone for two to three years, just one injection. Great. But the manufacturer has already told us that there's not going to be a study on uh, on the uveitis. It's not going to be tested for it. And because it's not going to be tested for it, it's not going to be available for it. 
So the patients who need it don't get it, and the patients for which there's something better and cheaper, they get it. Does that make any sense at all? Not to me. Another thing is the insurances are getting into our jobs. I had a 42-year patient with uveitis and the better eye, the other was amblyopic. The visual acuity had dropped to 0.5. And I thought, let's give it a test shot of trimcinolone just to see A, whether the cystoid edema reacts to it, and B, whether she reacts with a glaucoma. Just a little bit. I didn't want to use Ozordex because it lasts too long and you can't take it out. So it is all cheaper than Ozordex much cheaper, so we put that to the insurance company, but the insurance company expert, an internist, said no, this patient has to have Ozordex. Now where does that leave me? You know, if an internist knows something better than I, I didn't like the idea. So I did something different, if it tracked me with ILM peeling. And here are the results, six weeks post-operatively, still some never neck treatment, at six months still some never neck additionally, at 10 months, totally free of therapy, no drops, nothing, and a totally dry retina. One vitrectomy, not uh, 3,000 euro for Orzadex or 9,800 euro for Illuvium. It's, I suppose it's thinking out of the box, but I mean, that's what we're made for. That's what we learned medicine for. But if we let things run the way they do, the long-term consequences are that we are going to produce cookbook medicine. Medicine according to a drug leaflet, not according to what we think we have learned is best for the patient. Medicine that is guided by the industry, medicine that is guided by insurance. And once that point has been reached, what we will not need anymore is experienced doctors, doctors with special knowledge. Uh, as a matter of fact, the more you think about it, what we won't need anymore is doctors because bureaucracy will do everything for the patients. Is that good for the patients? I doubt it. So, before you get on that bus, remember that there's no such thing as a free dinner. We are accepting, unquestioningly, expensive drugs with little benefit. Why am I thinking of ocreplasma here? We're accepting transconjunctival surgery, which is 268 euro more expensive and gives no benefit over the alternative. Why are we using expensive machines without flow control when we have showed in studies that flow control is better? Why do we allow Congress programs to be influenced by the industry? Then the industry to monopolize studies. And why do we accept in our guidelines that are created by our peers? pro-industry stands. I think what's most important in one's life, not only of a doctor but everybody else, is that you like what you see in the mirror. That's not always easy. It is strenuous to think for yourself. You might make enemies, and trust me, I've got a few of those. You might even sacrifice income by thinking for yourself and thinking for your patients. But if you like what you see in the mirror, in the long run, it improves your quality of life and that of your patients. It makes you sleep better, gives you reason to be proud, and I think in the long run, it's even financially advantageous. So medical therapeutic freedom, can it be saved from extinction? I'm not overly optimistic, I must admit. Most important is that we demonstrate and live our competence. We are doctors, and we have to show the bureaucracy that we know something that they don't, that we have skills that they have, that we have chick sex for such a long time that we can deal with the patients so much better than they can. All the time we have to improve our knowledge and the skills. We have to resist senseless orders by bureaucracies, not give in. If we create guidelines ourselves or with our peers, make them flexible to allow out-of-the-box thinkers to have a freedom of developing new things like macular hole surgery. Resist the siren calls of industry. Think twice before getting on that bus. Do not panic when going off-label. Come on, we've used off-label 95% of the time before they invented the word. 
This is normal doctor stuff. We learned how to use drugs for the benefit of the patient without looking, oh, is it certified for that particular patient? And have the courage to make unconventional decisions. Because medicine is an art, I insist on that, and you have learned things that others haven't, and you can put them to use as others don't. See it as an art, treat it as an art, and practice it as such. Because, as Benjamin Franklin said, if everyone think is thinking alike, then no one is thinking. Thank you. <laughs>